Most High be praised. We are grateful to the Almighty for our School of Messiah Bible Institute. And we're thankful for the opportunity to again be able to provide teaching. We're thankful to the great, <clears throat> great one, our King, for his mercies and his grace toward us. So today we're going to cover the topic of water immersion. Water immersion or water baptism. And um, one might ask, well, this term water baptism is a, um, it's a given, you know? Why is it something that we need to talk about? Why is it something that we need to address, you know? I mean, most people are familiar with the term baptism. Most people are familiar with the idea of the process of it, but um, I've discovered that many are unfamiliar with its origins and some of the other points of significance that baptism hold that I find are very, very important as we see it with Hebrew Israelite eyes. And that's the thing that I want to do today. Uh, I've taught this subject before many, many times, but I find it necessary to come back to it, uh, especially in this kind of a setting. Uh, in our Bible Institute a setting, it's important that this subject of water immersion be covered so that we can have some uh, solid concepts from a Hebrew perspective on water immersion. So with that being said, let us pray, and then we're going to get into the study. Abinu, Melikainu, our Father, our King, thank you for your grace, your mercies, your goodness. Thank you for all of the Talmudim, the disciples, the students, who engage to gather to hear the teaching, to be trained biblically, and to learn of you. I pray, Abba Yah, that you would give me wisdom and insight as we cover this topic, that it would help those who are called to, to serve you in the ministry. And also, uh, if there are those who are presently in the ministry but that desire to know more about this topic, I ask you, Abba Yah, that you would bring enlightenment, bring understanding, greater insight, that your great name might be praised and that we may be able to grasp this subject more in depth and be able to share it and communicate it and appreciate um, this understanding to see how uh, the Bible uh, really comes to a greater light and great appreciation. So we thank you, Father, in Yahshua's name. All right, now what I want to do first and foremost, we want to look at definitions. Uh, these definitions help us to lay the foundation as to understanding these ideas on uh, water immersion and what they're associated with. So the first one that I want to look at is the word mikvah. Mikvah is a Hebrew word. It's a term which means the gathering of the waters. And it refers to a pool or a place of washing and immersion. It's referred to as the pool of immersion. And a mikvah not only is a, a, a pool of immersion where waters are gathered, um, but it can also be a lake 
a stream where waters are gathered or are passing through because immersions have been done in streams of water, lakes, as well as pools or uh, bathtubs. Uh, in the scriptures, there was a, uh, a pool, or I'll say a bathtub, if I can use that term, which was called the brazen laver. And that's where the priests would go in and they would uh, wash themselves before they would get ready to perform their services. And so um, the idea of the mikvah has to do with the place of immersion or pool of immersion. That's where immersions took place. And uh, when we talk about the idea of immersions, it's important that we understand that immersion um, not only involved a person going into the water completely, but it also involved the idea of washing and cleansing. So the concept associated with uh, immersion or baptism is a submersion into the water and also a cleansing that comes from being in the water. So those two concepts run hand in hand. And that's important to understand. Um, and I must say this, that when we begin to see this concept from Hebraic eyes, we, we have to dismiss a lot of the Catholic and Protestant uh, ideas that surround water immersion, because so oftentimes from those ideologies, there, there comes with it this idea and debate on what cleanses from sin? Does water cleanse from sin? Does it not cleanse from sin? And I find that coming out from Western Christian thinking, the impression that you get, especially when, you, when you've been trained theologically, is that you're, you're taught to look at a concept and immediately begin a debate. To, to basically say, uh, does water cleanse sin? What cleanses sin? And then go through all of these different things to prove why it doesn't. But what happens is that when you start doing that whole debate thing, you begin to cause questions to arise, even to the point of challenging the obedience to a command that is given to us by Elohim. And so it's important that we be people who are more concerned about obeying what the Father wants and what Messiah wants instead of trying to prove points or trying to say what cleanses and what doesn't. The Most High already knows what cleanses and what doesn't. And he doesn't care about our philosophy behind it. What he wants us to do is to follow what he said. So in the teaching, I want to bring about and express the ideas that were embraced, how our ancient fathers understood these ideas, how they saw it as a part of their life as it pertained to doing the will of Elohim. So it's important that we abandon a lot of the uh, religious philosophy and understand the scripture as to what it meant in its context and cultural historical framework. And then we move forward. So the other uh, terms that I want to look at, these other terms are Greek terms when we look into the writings of the apostles, this is where we see uh, the word baptize, baptism. Uh, we, we see those terms show up. And the whole term baptize, it, it all stems out of a Greek word, which uh, is equivalent to the word immersion, but it stems out of a Greek word. So the first Greek word that I want to look at is called baptizo. Okay? Baptizo, it is a Greek term 
and it means to submerge or to make whelmed. You know, the idea of like overwhelm, that means to be covered over with. To make whelmed means to cover over with or to submerge into. So the idea of baptizo means you take something and you submerge it into something else. That's the idea. It has to do with the idea of covering completely, all right, with fluid. To cover completely with a fluid. And then there's a term called baptisma. And this word baptisma, it just simply means baptism, which refers to, to uh, a thing that has undergone being baptized. One has experienced a baptism, all right? Then there's another term which is called baptismos. Baptismos in Greek. That term is translated by two terms. It's translated by the term baptism and also is translated with the word washing or washings. So the idea of baptism also carries with it this idea and context of washing. And it's important that we understand that. So that we can know that the concept of baptism is also associated with the idea of something that goes through a process of washing as well. So now that we've looked at these words, looked at these terms and have seen what they look like, we now want to look at the origin and development of water immersion in ancient Israel. Now, when you look into the Hebrew scriptures, there is nowhere where you actually see the word baptize or baptism in the Hebrew scriptures. And so one might say, well, I don't see the word baptize there, so they didn't have any baptisms in the scripture. So, so we need to, we need to um, you know, really... <laughs> Uh, address it because just because you don't see a word that you are familiar with that you are associated with in the Hebrew scriptures it does not mean that the practice was not there it just understood it from a different name and this is what we need to understand see the con the concept of undergoing mikvah from a Hebrew thought has to do with going to the pool of immersion and being immersed. That's the, that's the idea in the Hebrew. So it's important that we don't get caught up with thinking that because you don't see the word there. And there again, when we approach the Bible with this idea that you see one word in one particular section of the scriptures, like in the writings of the apostles, but then you don't see that same word in the English translation of the uh, Hebrew scriptures of the Bible, then you think that, oh, well, then baptism did not happen there. That, 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 what, what that shows is uh, that an individual uh, needs to expand their uh, understanding uh, of, of terms and need to need to understand or shall I say expand their understanding of immersion and certain types of uh, things that are related to conversion. When we deal with the whole concept of immersion or baptism in the ancient time, baptism was something that not only was practiced in the faith of Israel, but baptism was a common practice in all of the other religions as well. When I say other religions, I'm referring to the pagan religions. In the pagan religions, 
They also used water immersion or baptism as a means of initiation and in coming into their religion. So water immersion, whether it's full submersion or washings, was a part of the process of the religious cults of the ancient time. So it's important that we understand that so that, that we can see the ideas that are associated with it. So let's go to Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Because here's where we're going to find where we have the congregation of Israel being told to immerse themselves in water in preparation to receive the Torah commands at Mount Sinai. So let's go to it. And this is very, very important right here. What you're going to see is how the Most High brought his people into the covenant. Now, the Exodus chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. And uh, before I read this, I need to say that prior to Moses coming to the people and giving them the word from Elohim, the Most High had just brought our ancient fathers and also the mixed multitude of different ethnic peoples whom, whom they called uh, the mixed multitude. They were a mix of some Egyptians, some uh, Ethiopians, some uh, Kenizzites, and other people that were in Egypt. These people decided they were going to follow Yahuwah of the house of Israel. And they were going to attach themselves to Israel. So you had all these people here at the base of Mount Sinai. So listen to what Moses says. Alright? Um... Matter of fact, let me read, I, I need to read before, before I get to verse 10, let me go to uh, verse 5. Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to verse 5. Listen to this and lead up to it. Matter of fact, let me read from verse 3. It says, then Moses went up to Elohim, Yahweh called to him from the mountain. I'm at verse 3, I chose to back up and read more. It says, Yahuwah called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's what he did, bringing them out of Egypt. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whore is mine. But you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation or a set-apart people. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites, to the house of Israel. Verse 7. So Moses, or Moshe, came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that Yahuwah had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that Yahuwah has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to Yahuwah. Then Yahuwah said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud in order to that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. When Moses had told the words of the people to Yahuwah, 
Yahuwah said to Moses, and here we are at verse 10, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. I want you to underline that phrase. Have them wash their clothes. This is significant because that word refers to the baptism. It says, have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day. Because on the third day, Yahuwah will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So now, leading up to this statement, the Most High told Moses, tell the people that if they will keep my covenant, there will be a treasured possession. They will be a kingdom of priests, a set-apart people or nation above all the peoples of the earth. And so when Moses communicates this information to the Israelites, their response, and I want you to notice, their response to Elohim is, whatever Yah says, everything that Yahweh says we will do. Now at this point in time, Yahuwah had not given our ancient fathers any mitzvot or commandments. He had not given any Torah teachings to our fathers. At this point, there had only been an exchange and an agreement where the Most High says, Basically, will you keep my covenant? And the response of the people is, whatever you say is what we will do. So the exchange, the, the pledge had been made between Elohim, Yahuwah, our Elohim, and our ancient fathers. After that pledge, that exchange, that pledge had been made, where the people say, whatever you say, we will do. We will follow. The people at this time had made a commitment. Now, they had just been delivered. I want you to understand this. They had just been delivered or saved, however you want to call it. It's the same thing. They had just been delivered out of bondage. They had been delivered from captivity in Egypt. After that deliverance from captivity in Egypt, now what is about to take place is a covenant relationship. They get delivered. The commitment is made. And once the commitment is made, this is what Elohim tells Moses to command the people. He says, you go tell the people, since they're going to embrace whatever I tell them, they're going to accept me, they've made this acceptance of me, you tell them to go and wash their clothes. That's a phrase which means go to the waters and immerse yourselves. That's what that refers to. Go and immerse yourselves in the waters and then prepare yourself for the third day to receive the word of Torah. This is the whole process of entering into the covenant. So what we see here is that this water immersion is indicative that a person not only is solidifying their commitment to Elohim, but they are preparing to receive the covenant. So now the understanding of baptism now, that our ancient fathers saw it as, is that immersion was 
necessary for a person to enter the covenant. It was a sign that a person was getting ready to enter the covenant. That's what it is indicative of. Now, after this whole general immersion that took place by all of the Israelites, and it didn't just take place by all of the Israelites, but this took place by all of the uh, mixed multitude that were there as well. They entered this covenant also. There was a general water immersion that took place. And after this general water immersion and receiving of the covenant, after that, all of the descendants of the house of Israel were not required to be immersed in water. And the reason why is because the descendants were already in the covenant. The descendants were already regarded as set-apart people, as clean before the Most High. Now, if you ever go in the scriptures and you read where the Apostle Paul makes a statement, where, he, where, where what he's talking about, he talks about husbands uh, and wives where you have a believer and an unbeliever. And he says that the believing husband sanctifies the wife that's an unbeliever. And he says that the believing wife sanctifies the unbelieving husband. And then he makes a statement and he says, otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are clean. The reason why Paul said that is because being an Israelite, Paul understood that children that are in, that they come from Parents that are in covenant with Elohim are regarded as set apart to the Almighty. And so the practice was all of those who were descendants of this generation moving forward from Mount Sinai with that general water immersion and the covenant being made from that time moving forward. No Israelite that was born of that generation and moving forward was ever baptized. The only people that were baptized were Gentile converts to the faith of Israel. So if anybody wanted to become a part of the house of Israel, and there were many people that did, the stipulations were that if you were a male, you had to be circumcised, offer a sacrifice, and then you were immersed in water. There again, the purpose for the water immersion, it symbolized that an individual was entering the covenant with Elohim. All based upon the example that's given here in Exodus chapter 19. Verses 10 and 11. This is the uh, foundation of baptism right here. And for those who uh, may want to clarify um, this that we're teaching, because some people, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you bring this information out, they, they love to question, uh, you know, where you get the information from. Because, you know, for, for, for those of us that teach scriptures from a Hebraic perspective and, um, you know, we, we, we don't uh, follow the same uh, type of ideology, you know, they ask, well, where do you get your information from? So, so what I want to say is, for those, for those who would like to reference it, go and study rabbinic Judaism. And go and find out what passages or scriptures are used for the foundation for establishing mikvah and immersion. And it's going to take you right to that passage. So I'm sharing this because it's important that these things that we 
sharing and we're communicating, it's not new information. It is information that our ancient fathers used to solidify the basis for their methods of conversion when Gentiles were coming into the faith of Israel. That's why I brought us to this passage. So it's important that we understand that. You know, when we, when we come and when we teach, um, we want you to know that these things that we're sharing is not new information. There's a foundation to it. And so this is where baptism all began. It's, it's all based upon first following the command of Elohim, because Elohim commanded our ancient fathers to go and wash their clothes, which means go and baptize yourselves and then come to the mountain and you will hear me give you commandments. So, right off the bat, we start seeing that baptism is an indicator that you're entering a covenant. That's what it's a sign of, that you're entering a covenant. It is not just, as some would say, an outward expression of an inward grace. That is not what baptism means from its foundational understanding. Now, let, 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 me, let me say this as well. Now, there are symbolisms that come from the, the actual... Um, Baptism or immersion. There, there are symbolisms that, that we see from the, the, the actual act of a person immersing themselves. And yes, from the act, we can get the concept of dying to an old life, rising to a new life. And, and all of those things are attached to it. But initially, it has to do with the fact that a person is entering into a covenant with the Creator. That is the concept. And that same practice was continued when it came to converts that wanted to join the House of Israel. And that continued for hundreds and hundreds of years. All right? And as I said, those who were blood-born descendants were not baptized because they were considered as being in the covenant. So let's let's hold on to that thought because that's very important. So I'm going to keep moving ahead. <clears throat> so we uh, when we said that immersion um, signified entering into the covenant. Also, we need to note that immersion was the physical representation of people being attached to to Yahuwah and to his name. This is also a part of the idea of being in covenant with him. When you, when you are immersed into the waters, the waters are symbolic of life. It is symbolic of Elohim himself being the living one because uh, waters, when they're moving, represent life. So when a person is immersed into the waters, it's symbolic that a person is taking on the name of Yahuwah. So they are being attached to his name because they are being immersed into his name. So the idea of being immersed into his name is the same as being attached to his name. That's important. That's an important concept. Also, immersion represented that a convert was being born anew or being born again when they came up out of the water, okay? And in the ancient times, the converts immersed themselves. So the way it was, when a person was coming to Elohim, the person came into the water and they, they, they were uh, stood before another individual. But that person who they came before did not push them in the water or put them in the water. They came in front of the individual and that person oversaw their immersion. So a person came in and they immersed themselves in the water. 
It's a voluntary act. So true immersion, according to the ancient way in which it was done, a person came into the water and they immersed themselves in and then came out. And there was a person that was there that witnessed the immersion or oversaw the immersion. And the person who oversaw the immersion is considered to be the person who immersed them. Even though they didn't immerse them or put them in, you know, we see that practice being done today, but that's not the ancient practice. It's just that whoever was the overseer of the immersion, they were regarded as the one who baptized them because they testified witness to the immersion. So, uh, and I hope this is making sense because I know for those who are hearing this for the first time, uh, it's very different from their traditional way of understanding immersion. But there again, I'm trying to help us to understand that we need to come out of our uh, religious traditional way of seeing things and see things from the original Hebraic perspective and the way in which this practice was done. <clears throat> so we noted that the idea had to do with um, that immersion carried with it the idea rather of being born anew. Okay? So the idea of water immersion symbolizing being born again or being born anew was not a foreign concept to the Israelite leaders. They understood that concept as it pertained to converts that were coming in. All right? That's so that's that's very important that we understand that. Uh, you know, they, they, they understood any time a, a pagan Gentile would come and that pagan Gentile would uh, uh, get circumcised, offer the sacrifice, be immersed in water. And then after that was done, um, they would also take a new name. This is also part of the whole conversion process. So they, they knew that the, the whole concept of baptism was very, very important because it was symbolic that a person was being born again. Now, with that understanding in mind among our ancient fathers, prior to the coming of Yahshua, when Yahshua came and when he had the conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he tells Nicodemus, Unless you are born anew or born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of Elohim. Now, Nicodemus didn't quite get what Messiah was saying because you got to understand, Nicodemus was a man who saw himself in covenant with the Almighty. He did not see himself separated from the covenant of the Most High. He saw himself as being in covenant with the Almighty. So in his mind, he's up here thinking, well, okay, I got to be born anew. How do I go back into my mother's womb a second time? And what Messiah had to do was tell him, Nicodemus, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, and notice what Messiah said immediately after he said that to Nicodemus. Or when Nicodemus said, how do I get, how do I get back into my mother's womb once I'm old? Messiah then said, Unless a person is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. Now, Nicodemus, he understood the concept of being born of the water, because that's water immersion. He understood that idea. And that's what Messiah was conveying to him, that idea. But not only that idea, but also being born of the spirit. He was saying to Nicodemus, person has to go through a conversion and enter into covenant again. He's telling Nicodemus, dude, you're going to have to enter into covenant again. And with this process of being born of the water, because the idea of being born of the water is a term which indicates two things. I want you to understand this. Remember we're seeing this through Hebrew eyes. The water immersion or being born of the water. And that phrase born of the water, let me mention that again, is also a phrase that was understood 
for water baptism among our ancient Israelite leaders in the ancient time. They understood that concept prior to Messiah's coming. That referred to Gentiles being converted. They had to be born of the water, undergo water immersion. But it wasn't just that, because the water immersion symbolized two things, that a person has repented, and a person has died to their own life, risen to a new life, and embracing the covenant of Elohim. That's what it symbolized. The whole idea of born of the water symbolized all of that. So when Messiah made the statement that you need to be born of the water and of the spirit, he's telling them, basically, a person needs to repent and get immersed in water, which is what Yahshua said over in Mark when he said that, that, a, that when you go and you're preaching, you need to tell them, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But in that whole process, there is a spiritual birthing being born from above. And that's what the Messiah emphasized on with Nicodemus. But after he told Nicodemus that when you get to the conclusion of their conversation, what Messiah says to Nicodemus is basically, you know what, Nicodemus, man, and this is my paraphrase. He said, it's like, I, I don't understand why you're not getting my concept. You know, you are a master. He said, in other words, you, you are a moray. You are a teacher. You know, you, you, you are, you are, are, are you know, are, are Sanhedrin elder. You, you all of that. And you mean to tell me you don't understand this? See, Messiah expected Nicodemus to understand it. And Nicodemus knew those concepts. But he could not relate those concepts to himself. So you say, why could not Nicodemus relate those concepts to himself? This is why. Nicodemus didn't see himself like a pagan that was coming into the house of Israel, needing to be immersed in water, needing to go through the process of being converted and entering into the covenant of Elohim. He could not see that for himself. Therefore, it didn't click with him. But that's exactly what Yahshua was telling him. So let's move forward. We're going to talk about uh, immersion under the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, as we look at immersion under the ministry of John the Baptist, here is where this part gets cleared up. I said a little earlier that as history moved on from the initial general immersion of our ancient fathers at Mount Sinai and the receiving of the covenant, I said that as history moved on, every blood descended Israelite was not immersed in water thereafter because the idea was that they were already in the covenant. They didn't need to be immersed in water because they were already in the covenant. Does that make sense? I want us to understand this so we can catch this next part. Now, as time continued to move on, when our ancient fathers broke the covenant, remember, they broke the covenant, and the northern uh, ten tribes were scattered. They were removed from the land. The southern kingdom of Yahudah, they were removed out of the land. Jeremiah was prophesying before the southern kingdom were removed. The Most High said, I'm going to make a berit hadashah. In other words, he said, I'm going to make a covenant renewal with you. The term hadashah means renewal. I'm not going to deal with all the details about that now. We've already done teaching on that. But that's what he said he was going to make. The berit it's covenant. Hadasha means renewal. He said, I'm going to make a covenant renewal with you. He said, he said that not like the one when we were in Egypt, when I brought you out of Egypt, it's not going to be quite the same. There will be the same um, conditions in it. He said, but I'm not going to take the tables of stone or, or, or the Torah and write them again on tables of stone. I'm going to write it in your heart. And he said, you will be my people. 
He said, but the reason why I'm doing this is because you broke my covenant. So, when the Mosai declared that they had broken the covenant, the covenant was dissolved. The marriage was dissolved. That's why the people were kicked out of the land and removed. The Mosai had given a writing of divorcement to his people and kicked them out of his land. So, covenant had been broken. Now, the Most High said, I'm going to send you back to the land. Y'all going to rebuild the temple again. You're going to have everything back in order. And they did. Coming downstream to the time of the Messiah, they did. But here's the thing that we need to see so that we really understand the condition of our fathers during the first century. See, while they were thinking that they were still in a covenant relationship, the covenant was broken. All right? And because the covenant was broken, there was a need for the covenant to be enacted again. Now, here's where baptism comes in. When John the Baptist came preaching, what was different about John the Baptist is that John the Baptist came and he was preaching to Israelites. He was not preaching to Gentiles. He was not preaching to pagans and telling them to repent and be baptized. He was preaching to Israelites, and this is what he was telling Israelites. He was telling them to be baptized in water. Now, for us who read the Bible, who are not uh, familiar with the Hebraic understanding of water immersion, we really don't see how significant John the Baptist's preaching was. We don't really see how significant that was. See, all of the other prophets that came before John the Baptist called the people to Teshuvah, to repentance. They never called the people to be immersed in water. All right? This is important. John the Baptist comes. He not only calls the people to repentance, but he also calls them to be immersed in water. That was very, very powerful. And I want you to see this. It is very powerful. Open your eyes up. I want you to see this. I don't know if you see this. Because through Israelite eyes, this is huge. For John the Baptist to call Israelites to baptism meant that the Israelite was seen by Elohim as not being in covenant. Now you might say, well, I don't understand how that is so important. Okay, we're going to get to that. Let me just say a couple things and then we're going to get to that. But while I'm getting to that or saying a couple things, go, go to John chapter 1. You go to John chapter 1 and I want to uh, just list a couple points before I get to this one. All right, one of the things we need to note about the uh, immersion under the ministry of John the Baptist, or Yohanan the Immersion, is that this immersion was a sign that the renewed covenant had been enacted. Remember, we talked about the, the purpose of baptism, that the purpose of baptism signifies that a person is entering into a covenant. That's what it signifies. It's also proof of repentance from a sinful life and a visible declaration of conversion. Teshuvah occurs first, then there's water immersion. Next thing we need to note is that the whole concept of immersion continues to represent the death and burial of the pagan lifestyle. It continues, that whole idea. And we also see immersion continue to represent the born anew experience. And I already talked about John chapter 3, but here with John the Baptist introducing water baptism specifically to the Israelite, it was signifying that the renewed covenant was already here and being enacted. This is important information. All right? But now, as we go to John, and this last point I want to 
deal with right here is going to wrap up the teaching. We go to John chapter 1. All right? John chapter 1. And what we need to understand about this is that in the minds of the religious leaders and the people of that day, only the Messiah had the authority to call Israelites to baptism because it was the indicator that they would be entering into a renewed covenant, into a new era in Elohim. This is very, very important. I want you to pay attention to this. And one of the things found in the Bible that gives us that indication that it is so important is found over in John chapter 1. And we're going to get to that now. John chapter 1. And we're going to go to uh, the 19th verse. And I'm going to read from verse 19 through verse uh, let's see, where do I want to go through verse, uh, yeah, I want to read down from verse 19 all the way through to verse, um, 27. And it says, from verse 19, I want you to catch this. It says, this is the testimony given by John when the, when the Yehudim, or when the Judean Israelites sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed. I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Eliyahu or Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you of the prophet? You know, the one that Moses said, a prophet will come after me, who's like unto me, him shall you listen to? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you then? Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of Yahuwah, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then, and I want y'all to catch this now. I'm going to read this over again. <laughs> Verse 24, I'm going to read it over again. You, you want to catch this. They say, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Eliyahu, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. Now, what we need to catch here is that here you have these messengers sent by the religious leaders that were in Jerusalem. They're coming to John's baptism at the Jordan. So they heard about John. You know, here he's up here in the northern part of Israel. Jerusalem is in the southern part. They get word way down to Jerusalem, man. You got this dude that's baptizing Israelites, man. He's baptizing Israelites. See, that, so you got to understand the importance of this. I'm bringing this out, you know, with, with great emphasis because I'm trying to help expand the minds of us. So that we can understand that baptism during that time where Israelite is called to baptism is a huge, big deal. No Israelite had ever been called to baptism. The only, the, the only time that that happens is only when the Mashiach comes. So only when somebody comes that's associated with him. That's indicative of the renewed covenant coming on the scene. I hope y'all can catch this. Feeling this all in my bones. You know, these men that came to him from Jerusalem, and they asked John all these questions. They said, look, are you the Messiah? He said, no. Are you Elijah? He said, no. Are you that prophet? 
He said, no. Then who are you, man? He said, you need to tell us who you are. Because we, we, you know, we, we've got the leaders back down there, the Sanhedrin. They want to know who you are. You know, you, you're doing stuff down here that, that uh, is causing us to wonder who you are. See, if anybody else came preaching, teaching, working miracles, doing all that stuff, you know, and, and that's what they were doing, it's like, okay, fine. But when you start calling Israelites the baptism, hold up, hold up, that's, that's a sign that something's on the horizon here that we need to pay attention to. And after he gave them the answer and said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, one crying in the wilderness. So after he gives them that response, again they ask him. They said, okay, then if, if you're not none of them, then you need to explain to us why you baptizing, brother. See, they asked him who he was first off, but then they really got down to it. They got down to the thing that was bothering them. The issue had to do with why are you baptizing if you aren't any of them? That is why baptism is so important. Because it's indicative that the renewed covenant's on the scene. Now I'm getting excited about this. I, I really am. But see, this, this is this is Israelite. It, this, this is the Israelite perspective. This is the Israelite understanding. John was the one who was calling Israelites to baptism, and he was not going to get away unscathed by doing that. That was something very different from any other prophet. And not only did he call Israelites to baptism, but I'm I'm really honing it in now. Our Messiah went to John the Baptist and got baptized. See, see, see this, this, this is where you really see how the renewed covenant was show enough enacted. Because everything Elohim does, he does by the same patterns he did back when he brought our ancient fathers out of Egypt. Before they were about to enter into that covenant, he said, you go immerse yourselves in water. And our ancient fathers understood that water immersion was, was, symbol, was symbolic that the renewed covenant was here. If you were an Israelite being called to be immersed in water, it was a sign that, okay, you basically saying that we're not in covenant with Elohim anymore. And that this is what we got to do to get in covenant with Elohim. That's exactly what he was saying. So what we need to understand about baptism, especially as uh, the ministry of John the Baptist came in. Okay, Messiah said that there was no, no prophet greater than John the Baptist. The reason why is because this man right here ushered in the renewed covenant. This man right here prepared the way for Yahshua to come. But in preparing the way for our Messiah's ministry to be launched, it also was the ushering in of the renewed covenant. It was its enactment. That's where it all started. Okay? So this is very important that uh, we catch this concept. As they ask John, if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, if you're not that prophet, then you have to explain to us why you baptize. So it's important that we understand um, the concepts that are related to baptism. There's more to baptism than, than just an outward expression of an inward grace. There are telltale signs of what uh, actually was happening. See, there's some who would venture to teach, well, I won't say just some, but many who teach that the renewed covenant didn't come into place until after the death and resurrection of the Messiah. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. The death of the Messiah, all they did was ratify the renewed covenant, the enacting of the new covenant, the renewed covenant. That happened when John the Baptist came, that it happened with the exchange of, that was made between those who came to the Messiah and embraced him. Because in John's preaching, 
John preached and told the people, repent that the kingdom of Elohim is here, and he pointed them to Yahshua the Messiah to believe on. That was the exchange. That was the exchange. That was the covenant. And when Messiah began to start preaching and teaching, in particular the Sermon on the Mount, he was giving his Torah, and he didn't do away with the Torah that he gave to Moses, but he was taking it to a higher level, showing the spirit of the Torah and how to do it based upon having a right heart. He did that in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. That information was given. He told the Father in John chapter 17, I have given them your word. All right? So that whole exchange, just like... Uh, the Almighty, when he came down on the mountain and he gave them the teaching, the Torah, from the mountain, Messiah did the same thing. So the covenant has been enacted. It was enacted and then ratified. Just because it wasn't ratified yet doesn't mean that it wasn't in place. Everything began. The whole frame of mind with the Baptism coming in, it meant that a person was entering into the covenant. So I'm going to uh, close on that point. We'll pick up with uh, part two, where we will deal with uh, water immersion or baptism uh, within the framework of the ministry of Yahshua the Messiah in our next class session. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you for your great grace, your mercy, your kindness. I trust Abba, that this teaching has brought some illumination to your Talmudim, your disciples, your servants, your ministers, and that it will help to clarify some things and alleviate confusion in areas where this topic has not been understood more accurately. I pray, Father, that you would be praised and glorified and that you would continue to work mightily among your people. We thank you in the mighty name of Yahshua. Amen. Well, we, we're grateful for those who uh, chose to watch us by live stream. I trust that this teaching has been helpful, that it has been uh, a blessing to you, that it has helped you to be able to understand this uh, teaching from Hebrew lenses and uh, understand it with a new perspective, a new understanding in contrast to the traditional Western theological perspective that most uh, believers in the Messiah in the West understand baptism from. Uh, if you consider this ministry to be a viable uh, uh, place where truth is going forth to the nations, uh, then we ask that you would share a donation with us to continue this work that Elohim has put in our care and in our charge. Um, you can go to our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com and you could uh, go to the donate button or you could share with us from uh, a cash app and the cash app, uh, our uh, number for the cash app is dollar sign NCMMI. Again, that would be dollar sign NCMMI. And NCMMI is in capital letters. And, uh, you know, if, if uh, the Most High puts it on your heart to share with us, we definitely appreciate it. It assists us in being able to continue to do the work and getting the word out to the nations. We trust that the teaching has been a blessing to you and that it has encouraged and edified your life. Tune in again with us this Wednesday at 730 for the midweek teaching. And we thank you again for watching us here at Voice of Messiah Ministries in our School of Messiah Bible Institute class. Shalom.